The kingdom of God is full of all kinds of leaders. And Clearview family, I'm telling you, you're getting to hear a really good leader today. I'm away leading a men's retreat. And, and I looked around and I thought, I, I, I want you to hear from other people. The, so often we go to church and we, we kind of have a small world and our own church becomes our world. And I'm telling you, there's so much happening in the kingdom of God. And Ben Mandrell is, is a big part of that. He and Lindley actually have a Glass House podcast that I have truly uh, been better for it. Thank you, Ben, for uh, you and Lindley's uh, transparency. That is so key to helping ministers. It, it, you guys are just doing really good kingdom work, and it, it, it's really neat to have you in our fellowship today. So you guys, uh, Ben Mandrell is here, and I can't. I hate that I'm going to miss it. I really do. I, I really hate that I was going to be out today, but but I'm so, so excited that you're here, Ben. And you know, Jesus was always truthful. So bring the truth, Ben, and we'll be better for it, buddy. Well, good morning, Clearview. Great to be with you. As you said, I'm Ben Mandrell. I serve as the 10th president of Lifeway Christian Resources, and I know we got a lot of staff people that, that go to church here, so it's an honor to finally get to preach here. You know, I'm a student of culture. I, I love creating culture. The best statement I've ever heard about culture is this one, that culture is created by the positive behaviors you celebrate and the negative behaviors you tolerate. That's true in your home. It's true in your church. It's true in your workplace. It's the things that you celebrate and the things that you tolerate that create culture. And as Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So the most important thing about an organization, a home, or a church is its culture. And I found that one of the most difficult things about culture is that you don't really know what your house smells like until someone tells you. <laughs> and so I, I walk into churches all the time, and I just want to celebrate like five things that I've noticed about your culture that you may not even know are unique about your church. Keep doing these things. So first of all... You included students in your worship service. It's very rare. I almost never see that. One of the signs that a church is designed to reach unchurched people is that the young people enjoy the main service. It's very good. You're emphasizing prayer, which has to be the foundation for any movement or revival in the history of America. Number three, you have one of the most warm staff teams. I don't know if you're aware of this. When I walked in the door today, I was greeted by at least six or seven staff people. That's very unusual. Uh, very hospitable, practicing hospitality. Number four, you have a residency program here. I don't know if you're aware of that. That's very special. You have four young people that are training for ministry and getting experience here. I've never seen that in, in that capacity before in the churches I've preached. And then finally, I don't know if you know this, but you have two staff people by the same name. Uh, I don't know how that happens, but emails must get forwarded constantly. Uh, but praise God for your church and the sweet fellowship here. If you have a Bible, open up to Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, that's where we're going to be today, where the Lord's led me. I've never preached this message before, so if it's, a, if it's a dud, I need you to let me know. I won't repeat it. As you're turning there, as an ambassador for Lifeway, I just want to make a quick commercial about Lifeway. This is part of my job, so just two minutes, bear with me. We'll get right into the text. But there's five things I want to tell you about going on at Lifeway that I hope that will excite you. Number one, we're launching a brand new curriculum this year. It was just announced yesterday. It's called HiFi, which is an acronym for Here You Feel Included. In many churches now, there are non-religious people that don't feel included and don't understand the things of the Bible. So you have to, you have to give them a place to belong before they can believe. This curriculum is designed for young people and students and children to be able to understand basic concepts of the Bible without assuming they know what the Old Testament is or sanctification or even who Jonah was. The whole thing is designed for churches who are getting extra intentional about reaching non-religious families. And so we're very excited about this new line of curriculum that's coming out. Second of all, we're about to open a new teaming space in, in Brentwood and Maryland Farms. If you knew this, we sold our big building downtown uh, and we're, we're grateful we did that. Even before COVID, we were only using 65% of that building. Just didn't seem like great stewardship. So in the next couple of months, we're opening a new teaming space in Maryland Farms, and it's going to be a state-of-the-art conferencing area for our team to meet up, and everyone's very excited about that. Number three, if you haven't been to LifeWay.com recently, I hope you'll come back. It's way better. Uh, we've spent the last couple of years improving it. In fact, we just won, once again, Newsweek's online best shops award for our category and so we are every day making that website more easy to search more easy to find what you're looking for i know you can't feel and touch in a bible you can't smell it anymore but we're trying to do everything but smell it okay so if you got online and look at our bible section we have a great online bible store now that shows you all the different bibles and how you can get them and then number four just praise god for financial stability even through covid 
Uh, what has looked like a fire sale on the outside has felt like focus from the inside. LifeWay's had to make some tough decisions over the last few years, but here are some really good things about what's going on at LifeWay right now. Uh, we're in a strong position financially. We have no debt. We're operating with a positive bottom line. We have healthy reserves, and we've got money to invest in things like new curriculum. So please help me uh, squash the rumors that LifeWay is going out of business. Actually, we're doing quite well and moving forward with great confidence. And then finally, as Jason said, if you haven't uh, discovered our, our podcast called The Glass House, it's, it's not just for ministry people, uh, but it is primarily uh, an honest conversation about how we navigate the emotions of life, particularly for people who are in ministry who struggle with depression or anxiety or fear or shame. Uh, how do you wrestle with all that stuff and be a pastor of a church? Believe it or not, most pastors are human. And they have all the same struggles that you have and their wives. And so this podcast just, po just passed 100,000 downloads in the first year. We're really proud of it. And, and God's really doing a lot with it. So check out The Glass House if you haven't had a chance. All right? That ends the commercial for LifeWay. Donald Barnos once said this. I love this quote. When Christ was in the world, he was like the shining sun. When the sun sets, the moon comes up. The moon is a picture of believers. The church. The church shines, but not with its own light. It shines with reflected light. Now let that sink in for a moment. The Son of God, Jesus, appeared 2,000 years ago. He shows up and then he disappears. The great light of God appeared under the earth. That's Christmas. We already celebrated that. But then in the ascension, he goes up into heaven and then says to us, I'm sending you the counselor. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And from this point on, my light is going to shine through you upon other people on the earth. Which makes me think about what kind of moon are you? Uh, how much of the light of God is shining through you as you are a moon? I almost titled this message, Make More Moonshine, but that may be a problem <laughs> online. So look at these three moons, and I just want to ask you, which one, like be honest with yourself. I'm not going to ask you to identify which one you are, just with yourself. Which one of these is you right now spiritually? It's okay to say that you're the one on the left. You're discouraged. You feel defeated. You feel ashamed. Maybe you're like Peter after he denied Jesus three times. Like something's happened in your life, and, and it's left you feeling super discouraged. And you're in a funk, and you can't seem to get out of it. And people around you know it, and they're walking on eggshells around you. I've been there. It's called the dark night of the soul. And God uses those seasons of our lives for purpose. Or maybe you're in the middle. Your light is shining, but you're not brilliant like you used to be. It's not quite as powerful as it once was. You have memories of when you had personal revival. And you're, you're feeling good, but a little complacent, a little stuck. Or maybe there's a few of you that are just fluorescent this morning. And you're actually blinding the people around you because the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory of God is sitting on your shoulders and you're experiencing this season of, of great prosperity. You're feeling the presence of God. Everything seems to be turning to gold in your life and you're really in the spirit right now. And if so, enjoy it. Because just like the Mount of Transfiguration, that doesn't last forever. So which one are you? And with that in mind, now that you've locked into which moon you are, hear the word of God on this issue. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. That's been my theme verse for 2023 so far. I want to know and I want to test what really pleases the Lord. Another translation says, and find out what pleases the Lord. So Paul is saying your life goal should always be to please the Lord, that you would be walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And once you find out what pleases the Lord, do it again. And do it again, and do it again, and add more of that into your life. Because the reason you're still alive, in fact, I always say this, the reason you're not dead is because God still has an intended purpose for the light that's supposed to be shining through you. So that little song that we learned as kids still matters. It's still relevant. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. So how brightly is yours 
shining. You know, we Baptists, we boast in the doctrine of once saved, always saved. And we believe in perseverance of the saints, that you know, once you receive Christ in your life, you know, John chapter 10, verse 10 says, no one can pluck you out of my hand, so you're safe in the arms of Christ. However, the Bible also says that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible also says that we reap what we sow. So just because we have the security of being in the faith does not mean that we are sidelined or we're allowed, or we're allowed to let our, our light become dim. I don't know if you thought about this, but Christianity is something that we must practice. You have to keep practicing, just like in a sport. You have to keep practicing. So it's not something once believed and then you just sit in the belief. No, you practice your faith. You find out what pleases the Lord. Now, we are called to reflect the, the light of Christ in three main areas. I want you to notice in the text here how he talks about goodness, and he talks about righteousness, and he talks about truth. And I, I like the way that John MacArthur's commentary sums up the meaning of this text. He says this, we see, therefore, we see, therefore, that goodness pertains primarily to our relationship with other people. That's goodness. Righteousness primarily to our relationship with God. And truth primarily to personal integrity. In those three ways and in those, th those three things and in those three ways, the fruit of the light consists. So I don't know about you, but I love things that are simple. Like I, I love putting things together that are simple. And sometimes the Bible or even the Christian faith can feel very complex. I, it's one of my th favorite things about this passage. It, it just makes what we're supposed to be doing every day very simple. You're supposed to be growing in goodness, growing in righteousness, and growing in truth. And what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is I want to unpack each one of those and what it means for you to be doing that on a regular basis. So first of all is the word goodness. It comes from the Greek word for beauty. So to add goodness to people's lives is to add beauty to their lives. Actively pursuing opportunities to beautify the people around you. That's the practice of Christianity. And how easy it is to slip back into Christianity as something cerebral, academic, when really it's something to be lived out that spills out under the lives of other people. One of my favorite movies is the movie Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Uh, Major League Baseball coach. He's of the Oakland A's. They can't win. He's trying to get players on his team that can hit. And there's this one scene, and there's a picture where he's in the room with his scouts, and they're telling him the kind of players that he needs to pick up so that the Oakland A's can turn the thing around. And one scout says to him, I think we should pick up this player because he's a good hitter. This is one of my favorite lines. Brad Pitt leans in and he says, if he's a good hitter, then why doesn't he hit good? <laughs> and now it makes me think about Christianity. We see so-and-so, they're, they're a good Christian. Well, if they're a good Christian, then why don't they do much good? Yeah, they write a lot of books, or they have a podcast, or they seem to be influential, but when I look at their everyday life, who's beautiful around them because of their good deeds? That's the real measure of Christianity. Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. That's a powerful quote. People will forget what you said, people will forget you, what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Talk about a depressing idea for a preacher. You're all going to forget everything I said today. But you might remember how I made you feel. So I've been thinking about this and trying to let the text run through me because I think the best sermons are ones that have run through the preacher. And so in the morning times, in my prayer time, I've been trying to write down, like, uh, in each category, goodness, righteousness, and truth, like, a couple of things I noted. I think that pleased the Lord when I did that today. And it was in the category of goodness. And I just write it down. So I've got this growing list. It's pretty long now of things where I just sense that pleased the Lord. Mostly little, th little things that make a big difference. So here's a couple of things I wrote down in the terms of, of goodness. Um, it pleases the Lord when I tell someone what a difference they've made in my life whether through a note or through a face-to-face -face or through a coffee, to have prepared thoughts and to say, I don't know that you're aware of how much you've impacted who I am. Every time I do that, it's like when Jesus says, streams of living water will flow from within you. I feel that living water flowing from within me. 
I'm breathing life into a person. I'm telling them that they matter and they have mattered to me. Whether it's with my wife or with my kids or with coworkers, every time I do that, I feel the Holy Spirit moving through me. It's good. You're bringing goodness. It makes me feel good, uh, or I sense the Lord is pleased when I serve at the Nashville Rescue Mission. Uh, for Christmas, our family uh, got a slot to serve food one morning for several hours, helping those in need and seeing their hurting lives up close. And I know it was good for them, but I think I was the one that benefited the most. I, I just felt like the Lord was pleased that morning with our family. We did something good for someone. And how, how easy it is to forget that Christianity is primarily about bringing good into people's lives. It's easy to forget that. And so it's a simple exercise to just start taking inventory of, I just did something good and it felt good and I'm gonna do that again for somebody else. The second category is righteousness. So you can see here in the text, righteousness. Find out what pleases the Lord in righteousness. And righteousness is that vertical dimension. This is, this is not about me and people. This is about me and God. Are we in a good place? Am I growing in God? Has the Bible become a dead book to me? Uh, as David said, as, as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longs for thee, O God. Is that true of me? Am I becoming holier and more in love with God? Do I delight in the things of the Lord? Do I seek ye first the kingdom of God? All these questions are very important to our spiritual lives. And am I doing good things for God, showing him my devotion? Are we having long talks, he and I? This is a category that we have to explore. And I, I can't speak for you, but sometimes my walk with Jesus feels like sketchy internet. Like everything's going great, and then all of a sudden it drops. And for weeks I haven't mentioned Jesus' name. That can happen. I'm embarrassed to say that. I'm the president of Lifeway, and I can sometimes go a full week without saying the name of Jesus to anybody. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I've been thinking about righteousness and my relationship with God and how do I know if I'm in a right place with God? And I've been writing a couple things down. And here's a couple that I wrote down. It pleases the Lord in righteousness when I sit at the dinner table and have something to say about my time in Scripture with my family. I uh, studied the Bible for many, many years as a pastor of two different churches. I went to seminary. I have a doctorate in Bible, biblical studies. So I, I have a lot of knowledge in my head about the Bible, but it's old manna. And what did we learn about manna in, in the Old Testament is that you had, to, you had to pick it up new every morning. You couldn't save it. If you put manna in a jar, it became spoiled. And I've noticed something about myself is that I can come to the dinner table a lot with my family and not have a single piece of new manna to share. It pleases God when I say, I've been, I've been in scripture in this verse really challenging me lately. Sometimes we try to make family devotions into something very complex. Often it's just sharing what's running through you. It pleases God when I do that. The second one is really hard. It pleases God when I pray for my enemies. And when I say enemies, I mean people I have hard feelings toward. Like if we're in a conversation and that person's name coming, comes up, something inside me kind of clenches. And I recently uh, read a book on this called Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall. And I was just blown away by how unforgiving I am. One of the things he challenges you to do is to sit down and make a list of every person you can think of in which you have hard feelings. I got to 35 and was feeling pretty lousy. Most of these people have no idea that I have hard feelings. And I'm beginning to learn that one of the biggest parts of Christianity, one of the true signs of maturity is that you can do what Jesus did and you can, stand on a, you can be perched on a cross and say, Father, forgive them. You can't be right with God. You can't feel the flow of the Holy Spirit if you inwardly hate people or if you want to see them hurt so that you might get revenge. You will not take one step forward with God until you start dealing with that. So what I've started to do is I have my list of 35 plus. By the way, none of you in this room are on it. <laughs> and all I can do some mornings is just read out their names. 
And I'm just looking forward to the day when I have enough grace from Jesus that when I read their names, my skin doesn't crawl. That I can truly say, I've forgiven this person. And I may even have had a part in it. And I wonder if I could take responsibility for the part I played in it. You can memorize all the scripture you want. You can be a professional Christian and still inwardly hate a lot of people. Just ask the Pharisees. The third category is truth. It pleases the Lord when I am filling up my life with truth. And as I study what that word means, it refers to the idea of living your life out in the open as if you have nothing to hide. So if there were cameras placed in your car, in your home, uh, in your workplace, like you're some subject of the Truman Show, some reality show that, that people are now watching everything you do, there would be nothing that would cause people to question your commitment to Christ. That's integrity. And nobody in this room has perfect integrity. It's always a work in progress. So here's two things I wrote down in terms of how do I find out what pleases the Lord in terms of my integrity or in terms of truth. It pleases the Lord when I stop watching a television series that makes, series that makes my conscience feel uneasy. And here's the test for me. Um, if I'm watching something and I visualize myself on a plane and the person next to me would be embarrassed by what I'm watching or the words that are coming across the screen, I maybe should stop, stop watching that. And I know this is like simple Christianity here, garbage in, garbage out, but I, I have actually believed over the years that as I've gotten older that I don't need as many filters in my life, that I've reached some point of maturity that, that those images or those lies being told aren't somehow affecting me. And that's just not true. That's a lie. And so I just think we need to be careful how much we're streaming into our heart that is filled with lies. And let me say a quick word about pornography because it's so rampant in the church. Pornography, I've been told, is the greatest lie. And here's the lie. It tells men, particularly young men, that there are women out there who have intense physical desires and low emotional needs. It's a lie. That there are women out there that all they want to be is physical, but they don't care about being nurtured or cared for. And it creates a category in a young person's mind that doesn't exist. So what are, what are you watching or taking in that God is just not pleased with it? A second one in terms of truth is this, is it, it pleases the Lord when I'm lovingly honest with people. Uh, I like the phrase compassionate candor. You know, it doesn't help a person who lives with you or works with you for you secretly to be mad at them and they have no idea that you're mad at them. And I've noticed how often I do this. How often I'm tempted to speak about someone when they're not in the room in a way that I would not speak to them when they are in the room. That's not integrity. So what I'm learning is, is it's, it's, Scripture says that we're supposed to speak the truth in love. And so if I have a problem, I'm supposed to go to my brother or sister and sit down and say, hey, help me understand this. I feel hurt by blank. And might I say this to all the gentlemen in the room? By solid research, we know this, that one of the hardest things for a man to say to another man is, you hurt me. And so we'll just go around carrying the hurt instead of voicing the hurt so that it can be solved and reconciled. I'm finding that God is pleased when I have the courage to sit down with someone and explain why I'm hurt and how we can work through it. That's being truthful. So do you see how easy it is to practice Christianity without doing good to other people or without caring about the vertical dimension or without leading with personal integrity? It actually is quite simple to just show up to church every Sunday and appear to be a good Christian all the while, caring nothing about the three categories in which Paul said Christianity is all about. So here's the challenge. You, you can do what I've been doing. It's very easy. If you like Apple Notes like I do, or if you're a paper and pencil person like my wife, go for it. Make three lists, goodness, righteousness, and truth. And over the next couple of weeks, every time you sense that you please the Lord in one of those categories, make a note of it. And over the next 30 days, or maybe you make this a year goal like me, begin to stack up what pleases the Lord and take notice of the things that he wants you to do. 
And the more you live inside those lists, the more you live inside the Holy Spirit. And where the, whole, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. So if you want freedom in your life, those are the channels. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now with that, I, I think one of the weakest parts about preaching in 2023 is application. I think we often leave people wondering, so what the heck am I supposed to do with that? So one of the ways that I've learned over the years to help people with application is I plant three questions in the crowd. One is from somebody who's walked with Christ for years, a seasoned Christian. One question is somebody who stumbled in here and has no idea what the Bible is. They have no idea how they got here. And then another one is from student and student ministry because I've found that students ask the questions the adults are afraid to ask. So here are three questions that I thought of that someone might ask me about this text. A, stu- a seasoned Christian would ask me this. Well, but, but wouldn't you agree that Christianity is not about surface level works? Are you saying in this sermon that good deeds are more important than sound doctrine? So, so I know that this message is not the deepest theologically. Uh, you might even consider me a theological lightweight if this is the only sermon you ever hear. But before you get in your car and say that I'm fluffy in prosperity gospel, hold on. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 13, and you can disagree with him. And he told this parable. He said, a man had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on that tree. He didn't find any fruit. So he told the vineyard worker, listen, for three years, I've been coming for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any fruit. Cut the thing down. Why should it waste my soil? Now, some parables are hard to understand. This one is not. Jesus makes it very clear that the owner of the vineyard is looking for one main thing from the tree. He wants to see some fruit. And we are saved by grace. And where is the grace of God in this parable? It's there. How is it there? And how it finishes. Look at verse 8 and 9. But he replied to them, Sir, leave it this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Perhaps it will produce fruit next year. But if not, then you can cut it down. So here's the loving patience of God. God knows that some of you in this room are a dark moon. It's been a while since there's been some fruit on your tree. You've been through a lot. The last three years, I would say, have been the hardest years of my life. And God is patient with us. But then there comes this moment where God says, okay, enough. How about we get back to practicing goodness and righteousness and truth? Why don't we call an end to the pity party that you're throwing for yourself? And start practicing the faith. A good-hearted skeptic asks me this question. If Christianity is all about the truth, then why are so many Christian leaders being exposed for their double life? It's no secret in the last decade that a staggering number of high-profile Christians have been exposed for secrets in their lives. It's been deeply discouraging to me. It makes people wonder if Christianity is a charade. If you walked in here as a guest and you're a skeptic and and you're not sure you believe Christianity, I can see why you would say, why are all these people wasting their time? Look Look at what it's done to all the famous Christians. And yet I would say this with humility. The book of Galatians, we are warned about looking down on other people who have had moral failures. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says that if you're involved in going to expose and restore a person, you'd be very, you better be very, very careful because you might get sucked into it too. You're made of the same stuff. So it says this in Galatians 6 1, brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. So whenever we're called to confront the weaknesses and the sins in another person's life, we should not lose sight of the fact that under the right circumstances, we are capable of the same sins. That no one in this room is immune from a massive decision that would ruin their lives. And the minute you start to think that, you become a Pharisee. Uh, I don't know if you've read the uh, book or or seen the movie The Hobbit. But uh, 
the great enemy in The Hobbit is a fire-breathing dragon. And this little humble hobbit named Bilbo has to somehow defeat this fire-breathing dragon. And he's armored on all sides. And there's simply no way to defeat this giant enemy. And yet he finds out that on the underside of the creature, right there inside his belly, in a little spot, there's an unexposed place where one fiery arrow could get through. One tender spot on this giant creature would bring the whole thing down. And I think what Galatians 6 says is, don't forget that every single one of us has a spot like that. It might be a tendency toward greed or lust or an obsession with physical fitness and vanity. Or it might be a, a loose tongue or a hot temper. But if your buttons are pushed in the right way on the wrong day, you are capable of destroying your life. And so for those who might be skeptics of Christianity, I would say, don't judge Jesus for what his followers do. And all of us have a place in our life that we have to watch very closely, lest the Holy Spirit be quenched and we fall into a great season of moral failure. A student asks me this. People at my school make fun of those who live clean, moral lives. By living out my faith, should I expect to feel lonely all the time? It's a conversation that I have, I have with my teenagers who attend public school. Well, the answer is yes and no. Yes, being lonely is part of the Christian life. In fact, Jesus says, narrow is the way that leads to life and few find it. That means there are very few people that are interested in living a righteous life. So if you're looking for acceptance in a large group, you're probably going to be disappointed. And if you are accepted as part of the large group, one has to question whether your values have now become their values. So part of being rejected by the larger group is the encouragement of knowing I'm decidedly different. And so, yes, there is a loneliness piece that comes with walking with Christ, particularly through high school. But I know you don't believe me, but high school is not reality. I wish I could go back and talk to my high school self. Believe it or not, upon graduation, all points for popularity that relate to sports or academia die. I can't remember, and I'm, in, I'm, I'm horrified, that none of you have come up to me today asking me what my GPA was in high school or how many points I scored in my best basketball game. And so I have such a hard time getting through with my teenage kids. I'm like, like, listen, this isn't reality. This isn't how it's always going to be. Life isn't always going to be determined on what popular crowd you are in or not. And so my advice to you, student, is the same that Ecclesiastes offers in chapter 12. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. These are the formative years. And so if you're a student in the room, I would say, here are a list of the lesser questions. Uh, these are not unimportant questions. Everybody asks them. Am I part of the popular crowd? Am I highly regarded? Are people liking and sharing my social media? Am I puny and weak or muscled and toned? That last one's a big deal in my house. My three teenage sons are in what they call bulking season which means I can't keep enough eggs or protein shakes in my house. They think a lot about how their bodies look and how they, re how they compare to other people. Like you can't not think that way as a young person. But what if you flipped the script? What if you decided to be different? And you asked yourself greater questions like these. What good thing can I do for someone at school today? That one kid that sits all by himself every single day, I'm going to be the guy. I'm going to walk over and engage. What is one way I can show God my devotion today? On my drive to school, I'm going to listen only to Christian music today. I'm just going to hear some lyrics that love God. And I'm going to make some time in my car to just ask the Lord to give me strength today to be different. How can I set myself apart as someone who cares for the truth? Here's a real practical way. Stop copying other people's homework. Like actually do your own homework. So that when you turn things in, you're proud of yourself for completing it. 
rather than feeling gross inside that that's not your work. If you ask those questions on an everyday basis, you'd better believe you're going to be lonely. You're going to feel different because you're supposed to. But don't forget that Jesus said this, seek ye first the kingdom of God and then all those other things will be added unto you. If you fill your life with the greater questions, if you think more about goodness and righteousness and truth, you're gonna see that you'll have a life that God can bless and he will in time. You know, it means a lot to us that you would come here today and be a part of who we are. It, it really does matter to us more than you might realize. Sometimes I think we underestimate the power we have to influence people. You know, if you would look around your world, you'd be amazed at how many people would receive what you have to say to them. You could be a digital missionary. You don't have to post everything on Facebook or we're not asking you to go on your favorite social platform, but I would challenge you to look around your world. I guarantee you might have a friend, even in a different state or another part of the world, something was said today, whether a sermon, a prayer, a song, something was said that could mean a lot to them, man, send it to them. You'd be amazed at how much of a difference that could make.